It's seven o'clock. This is Drought Emergency, a Sky News special programme. I'm Mark Austin, live at Buell Water in Kent. Coming up. More than half of England moved into drought status after the drier summer in 50 years. As the waters recede, it could mean more hosepipe bans and tougher local restrictions. And perhaps more scenes like this, the burnt out shell of a family home consumed by fire. It's the emotional effect and it's the stress and it's, it's also the danger to human life. Also coming up, we go underground to assess the state of the country's water supply. And I'm live in Cambridgeshire, looking at the best way to bolster the UK's water security. One possible solution, a giant water pipeline stretching 250 miles. But will that be enough? And I'm live on the banks of the River Rhine in Western Germany, as Europe suffers what could be its worst drought in 500 years. We report from a Spanish reservoir, now at its lowest level in almost three decades. And in southwest France, we witness the desperate villagers joining firefighters from across the continent to tackle a huge wildfire. And here in Germany, one of Europe's major waterways, down to a critical level with a potentially devastating impact on trade. So good evening from what should be the largest stretch of open water in southeast England, Buell Water in Kent, on the day a drought was officially declared across more than half the country. After the driest summer for 50 years here in Kent, a hosepipe ban has just been introduced and this body of water, which services much of the county, is now at only 60% of its capacity. The tinderbox conditions are sparking wildfires here. Right now, fire crews are dealing with a large blaze more than 200 miles away from here in Derbyshire with 50 properties evacuated. The fire risk is also high in Europe, of course. Later in the programme, we'll report from southern France and see firsthand the economic impact in Germany. But we start in England, where the Environment Agency has declared a drought in eight of its 14 areas. In southwest England, southern and central England, and the east of England. They are Devon and Cornwall, Kent and South London, Hertfordshire, and North London, East Anglia, Thames, Lincolnshire, and Northamptonshire, the East Midlands, uh, the Solent and South Downs, from where our home editor, Jason Farrell, has our first report this evening. Our once green and pleasant land has been sapped of colour, from grass in Hyde Park yellowed to crop fields harvested weeks ahead of schedule due to the heat. The risk of fire is heightened, this a grass fire in Raynham in Essex. Chris Sparks from Hampshire doesn't know how the fire started in his yard. Oh right, so it spread all through the roof. Yeah. And then... Good God. But it had soon devoured a bedroom wall and then his roof. It's like charcoal has kind of rained down on your living room. We, we, well, yeah, because what's happened is because it was so hot, it was just literally falling down. The whole house is destroyed, timber frames charred, shoes melted, as is the television. Yesterday, a tractor caught fire here in Codford in Wiltshire. Fire risk is another setback in a difficult summer for farmers. It's the emotional effect and it's the stress and it's, it's also the danger to, 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 to human life. And uh, our, our staff are very dedicated and they're very keen to fight the fires. And sometimes we, we have to tell them to ease off a bit because I'd much rather have a fire than a staff injury. With some areas of the country not receiving significant rainfall all summer, the National Drought Group declared an official drought in eight of its 14 areas of the country. It means more hosepipe bans and residents and businesses being asked to conserve water. 
the important thing is that the water supply remains resilient uh, for this year. There's no uh, no real issue there. And these are precautionary steps that are being taken to ensure that we're taking care of our water resources in case we get a dry winter and then run into potential problems next year. People here at the Flower Pots pub in Hampshire say they do what they can. When you've got a garden, you put quite a lot of money into it and it's all shrubs and you're sitting there with one watering can. But what I have been using is old washing up water. Anything at all is going into the garden at the moment. It's tough. I'm trying to be a bit more environmentally friendly. Obviously wear the hosepipe ban, not using water, having showers, not using bath. In the West Yorkshire Pennines, a usually submerged Norse village has partially reappeared. This centuries-old packhorse bridge now stands as a worrying low watermark in what should be an abundant reservoir. It's just another oddity in the new landscape created by this extraordinary heat wave. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Drought may have been formally declared today, but some areas have been feeling the effects for weeks. Parts of southwest England had their driest July in more than a century. But experts say this isn't just the new normal, and in fact, it will get worse. Hannah Thomas-Peter reports now on the impact of uh, climate change and warnings about our future. Colliford Lake on Bodmin Moor is Cornwall's largest reservoir and in this relentless heat, it is drying up. The receding waters revealing a landscape that has been hidden for decades. You can actually see where the water levels were, around where the black parts are. Cindy Cooper runs a campsite near the shore. She is already feeling the effects of drought during the peak of the tourist season. People come here for the views. You normally can see out the windows to the river and at the moment you can't see any water at all, so it's not very nice for them to come down and have a look when there's nothing there to see. So it could impact your business eventually? Yes, it could. Down the road at Nine Stones Farm, they are trying to keep the animals cool. Emma Collison is worried about the dwindling stream that supplies her with fresh water. They have only just recovered from a TB outbreak here and can't afford another disaster. We've come out of COVID now and and things you, we thought would go back to normal, but I don't think there is a normal anymore. There's just no, you know, we weren't expecting this kind of weather and, and I've never known anything like it. I know I'm, I'm not that old, but it's just crazy weather conditions, crazy. In some ways, she's right about that. Devon and Cornwall have just experienced their driest July in over 100 years. River flows are well below normal and reservoirs and groundwater sources are receding. And unfortunately, there's no relief in sight, no forecast for significant rainfall where it is desperately needed. Scientists say this is the new reality of climate change and it's going to get worse. The UK will be seeing more unprecedented events like we've had uh, recently. Uh, hotter, drier summers, more intense heat waves, uh, more droughts with impacts on uh, human health, uh, ecosystems, wildfire risks, uh, and so on. A bleak picture of little comfort in this region, now being asked to conserve water and protect this precious resource. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News, at Colliford Lake in Cornwall. Well, the effects of the extended dry spell are also being felt in the north of the country. Our correspondent, Inzamam Rashid, is at a reservoir near Holmfirth in West Yorkshire. And Inzamam, a hosepipe ban already in place there. Yeah, that's right. It will come into effect in a couple of weeks' time, Mark, on the 26th of August. Why is that? Well, Yorkshire, a place where you would expect a lot of rain, uh, just hasn't simply been getting it. In fact, they've got the lowest levels of rainfall for 130 years. What's that led to? It's led to reservoirs being incredibly lower levels than they anticipated and than they expect at this time of the year. This reservoir behind me has actually been so so low that its natural effects to um, 
pass water into rivers nearby to keep the habitat and wildlife healthy. Uh, it hasn't been doing that job. They usually uh, have around 20 litres per second going into uh, the river uh, nearby to keep that nice and healthy. But instead, they've had to install pumps here to make sure that other rivers can get that water. They are, in fact, now going to reduce that. That's because there has been a drought order implemented here uh, by the government, which allows Yorkshire Water to take control of the reservoirs and exactly how they work, particularly because of the hot weather we've been having. But, Mark, look at this. Yorkshire is England's largest county. Yorkshire Water supplies 5 million customers. They'll be facing a hosepipe ban in two weeks' time and potentially, whilst they're not on the drought list today, the Environment Agency believe because of this hot weather, because of the lack of rainfall, they could be on that list very soon. OK, Inzaman, thanks very much indeed. Well, the country's reservoirs are not the only source of water, thank goodness. Aquifers, which are underground layers of permeable rock, provide up to 70% of drinking water in some areas. But this valuable resource is also dwindling. Our science correspondent Thomas Moore reports now on the state of the UK's water supply. Even well beneath the scorched fields of Somerset, there are signs of the drought. Work the way down and start up from the chamber. We made our way deep into the Mendip Hills through Swildon's Hole. And followed passages carved out by water over millennia. But the driest summer in 50 years has reduced the stream to a trickle. This is the main stream that's flowed from the surface through the passages and here it's joined by a tributary called Rolling Thunder. Now this water is rain that has fallen on the soil, come through the rock and as you can see it's been so dry there really isn't much of it. Beneath many parts of the country, rain is held in rock like a soaked sponge, overflowing as springs and also tapped by water companies for drinking supplies. It's called groundwater and after eight months of low rainfall, levels are falling. We've got kind of various factors that will kind of affect the water that's running down into the cave. In general, yeah, things are, things are that little bit drier. Yeah, things are a bit drier than, than how maybe we'd see them um, over the past kind of few years or so. In the southern half of England, levels of groundwater are below normal, even exceptionally low in some places. Southern Water is keeping a close eye on the aquifer beneath the South Downs. It pumps out more than 170 litres of groundwater every second to supply towns like Brighton. We're monitoring it very, very closely. Um, you know, we'll be, be prepared to react with, you know, hosepipe bans or, you know, things like that if needs, uh, if needs be. Uh, I think the, what's more concern for us is the, is the longer term. It's the, you know, it's the impacts of climate change. It's how we're managing water supply, you know, for the next, uh, for the coming decades. If the sort of weather that we've seen this summer is going to become the, become the norm. The soil is now so dry that even when the autumn rains come, it will take weeks of wet weather before water starts to refill the underground aquifers. This drought is likely to last, even when the summer heat fades. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Somerset. Let's speak now to Tom Heap, the presenter of Sky's weekly climate show, who is in Cambridgeshire this evening looking at the possible solutions to this uh, crisis. So, Tom, help us out here. What is going wrong with water policy in this country? Well, I think critics would say that it's been too focused on, if you like, just-in-time water delivery and keeping the bills very low, as opposed to making a resilient long-term water supply network, especially in the face of climate change. And one of the areas that's particularly been paying for that is our natural environment. Many of the water companies have been pulling a lot of water out of the rocks beneath them. You just heard from, from Thomas Moore there. And the effect has, on that of that has been 
rivers in serious trouble. Not just this year, where incidentally we've got six rivers at least that are at record low levels, spreading from the Rother up in Yorkshire to the Tain in the West Country to the Waveney across here in Suffolk. But that has been a problem for quite a few years for many rivers. And the impact of that on wildlife, well, I can show you a little bit here from the, this is, comes from the dry bed of this reservoir. I don't know if you can see there are tiny mussels on here. Well, these are, you know, completely lifeless, dry as dust as a result of low water. So that's the kind of effects that low water can have on our natural world. And there has been a feeling that policy has put the burden on the natural world. And we now may be feeling that as well as we look forward with all these challenges from climate change that Hannah Thomas-Peter was talking about earlier. So how do things get fixed here then? <laughs> well, probably with a lot of political concentration and quite a lot of money. So the ideas that are required near, need a lot of infrastructure, a lot of concrete, a lot of digging, a lot of machines. We've been to look at a project where they're pulling water down from the Humber through massive pipes like this, capable of shifting 84 million litres a day down to this area, East Anglia, all the way as far as Colchester, 250 miles in total. Now, that scheme alone costs about half a billion pounds, but they say that won't be enough in the long term. We will need to think about digging more reservoirs. And just later this year, probably in the autumn, a lot of projects, four across the southeast, that's two in East Anglia, one in the Thames Water area and one in Hampshire Water, projects for new reservoirs are going to be given real consideration by the government. They're going out to consultation, which is a key stage in them actually happening. But they'd probably take at least two decades thereabouts to come into reality. But uh, a lot of people listening to this, Tom, will be saying, what's going on? We're a, we're a wet country. We're a nation of rainfall. <laughs> Well, this is very true. I mean, the, the cameraman, James, here has given me an umbrella, which he keeps in his van to keep the rain off presenters. Well, it's becoming very handy to keep it off me today. You know, that's what people imagine. We're black umbrellas. We're soggy Glastonbury's. We're wet Wimbledon's. But the truth is, in many parts, especially of the southeast, we actually get less rainfall per head than many, many really, really hot countries that you would associate with being dry. So there's a question about whether we need to change our behaviour. Do we need to think about shorter showers, turning that tap off when you're brushing your teeth, maybe even fitting a little infrastructure into our homes like uh, rainwater harvesters or things that capture your bath water and maybe put that on the garden rather than using a hose full of pristine drinking water? And even maybe, do you need to flush the loo every time you go for a wee? These are the kind of things that maybe we need to be thinking because we used to use around 80 we used to use around 80 litres of, person, uh, of water per person per day. That's gone up to around 130, and there are more of us in the southeast. Big questions. Yep, a few realities to think about. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Well, welcome to Koblenz in western Germany, where on the banks of the Rhine River, one of Europe's busiest and, of course, most important waterways, but the water levels here have reached critically low points in the last few days, 40 centimetres today, making the river impassable for many cargo ships transporting goods like coal and petrol. And this is a crucial trade route. Almost half of the European Union is now under an official drought warning, with officials suggesting that this could be Europe's worst drought in 500 years. Well, let's take a look at those water warnings across the continent. 63% of land is under an alert or warning state of drought. And severely drier than normal weather is now predicted until the end of the summer. Here on the River Rhine, water levels have fallen to below the critical 40 centimetre mark, making it virtually impassable for many barges. Well, later on, we'll hear from our correspondent in the south of France, where more than 1,500 firefighters are struggling to contain a major wildfire. But first to Spain, where the hottest July in over 60 years has resulted in the key Venezuela reservoir dropping to just 12 per cent of capacity. From there, our special correspondent Alex Crawford reports on the crisis in Spain. Hard to believe this is the bed of one of the largest reservoirs in southern Spain. This jetty was floating and the pedal boats were being used right at this spot less than a year ago. But now, parts of the Venuela Reservoir are bone dry and getting drier, and it's operating at only around 12% of its capacity. 
Look at the state of this earth. The cracks are so deep. The levels are dropping at a terrifying rate. All of this was once underwater and the environmentalists say it's not just climate change that's a problem it's water mismanagement and farmers switching to crops which demand much more water whatever the reason the record high temperatures have led to fractured relations here and what's being dubbed the water wars as farmers and environmentalists squabble over who and what's caused this these are some of the exotic fruits being blamed for the water drain Many farmers like Paco have branched out into growing mangoes and avocados. He's telling us here how efficient his irrigation system is. But the drought has meant his mangoes are still significantly smaller and his income has dropped nearly a quarter over the past few years. The lack of water, fires, everything, it's all down to climate change. And we're all causing climate change, so we have to change. He's built his own reservoir and is investigating growing less thirsty fruits like Barbary figs. But all the farms around here are suffering under these extreme conditions. Ecologists in the area say poor farming and lack of planning by the authorities are responsible. There's already a problem because too many farmers are using irrigation and we have to stop that and persuade them to find alternatives like recycling water and growing other fruits. The hot dry weather is due to continue until the autumn with farms working all hours to try to save their crops. Marooned boys show just how tourism is already suffering around the reservoir. From May to October. Mm -hmm. Elena Sanchez was left with no option but to close down her water adventure business. And, we and there was water here? Yes. So it's and she's worried if farming of tropical fruits like avocados and mangoes collapses, it'll have a devastating impact. The tropical industry it brings about 10,000 employments to this area. So what are these people going to work in if we don't have tropicals? Spain produces the bulk of Europe's fruit and vegetables. This country's water crisis is going to reach far beyond its own borders. Alex Crawford, Sky News in southern Spain. Well, from Spain to France, which is experiencing its worst ever drought, 100 towns have completely run out of water. And firefighters from across Europe, Germany, Poland and Romania and Italy have been drafted in to help tackle a wildfire near Gironde in Bordeaux. And that's forced the evacuation of around 8,000 homes. Sky's Laura Bundock reports now on a wildfire that has been burning for more than a month. Wildfires swept through here and left a haunting sight. The flames are gone, but look at the smouldering soil. I'm firefighter, still 26 years, and I never knew that situation. Fire Chief Stephanie Martin says drought and heat wave are a deadly combination. When it's dry weather, all the water in the vegetables are just going out. When the fire arrives, it's just um, easier because all the trees have less defense to uh, fight against the fire. The wildfires in Gironde have been burning for weeks. They're battling around the clock on the ground and from the air. There are 1,500 firefighters here from all over Europe. And closer to home, we found village vigilantes, local volunteers carrying and doing what they can. But they all agree they won't give up. It feels relentless. This is the problem. Walk anywhere in the forest and you'll find these pockets of smoke. The peat soil here is now so hot, you can actually feel the heat rising up from the ground below. It is truly terrifying for people here. They desperately need rain, but can only hope it comes soon. 
Well, Laura joins us now live from Gironde. And Laura, perhaps no surprise, you know, you're talking about the, the fear for the people living there, that so many local people are, are physically helping the firefighters out. I think they've little choice, Jane, but to get involved. Such is the scale of the problem and the emergency here. The weather is making things so much harder. It is hot and it is really dry. The conditions are difficult and they're dangerous. And today, the real fear has been flare-ups within the forest because the ground is smouldering. Just take a look over to the side here. You can see a classic example, a patch of smoke there rising up from the soil. And we're seeing this everywhere we go at the moment. There were fires here back in July. All those fires obviously have been put out now. But the ground itself has stayed so hot. You see these patches of smoke rising up. And the problem is they catch onto the tinder dry ground here. And that's when the fires restart. And today, the real problem has been the heat, this intense heat, the hottest day of this current heat wave, we're told. Temperatures over 40 degrees, which is why the firefighters told us it's a critical day. We were out with them this morning and we saw what they're doing to try and bring these fires under control. Huge fire breaks being dug, damping down, dousing the land. But it feels never-ending. As soon as one fire is put out, another one pops up elsewhere. And the trouble is the drought. They haven't had rain here for over a month. It's what they really need. And although it's forecast on, on Sunday, one firefighter told me a day's rain won't be nearly enough. They need at least two weeks of solid rain if these wildfires are to be brought under control. Laura, it sounds absolutely terrifying. Thanks very much. Well, where we are is where the River Rhine and the River Mosul meet. And last summer, this area here was devastated by floods. There were more than 100 people killed here. Uh, and if we, we get the camera to pan over, where I'm standing is would have been deep, deep within the River Rhine. The water was up to the tops of where those caravans are in that campsite behind us. Uh, so... That just shows you the extraordinary difference in the water levels. It would have been way, way over my head, and it would normally be way over my head if 12 months on the weeks of dry weather have seen the water levels now falling to really critical levels here. There is a real fear that the Rhine could have to be closed to many of the larger cargo ships. And I've been talking to people in this region about the economic impact that the drought is having on them. The Rhine is shrinking, shrinking so much it now has a beach. Germany's commercial artery carries every cargo imaginable, steel, fuel, chemicals, as far as the North Sea. But at the busy port town of Koblenz, the barges are now leaving three quarters empty. On the wall, there are different colors and that's the normal water level. Now it's decreased very much. They need more ships for the same cargo. That means the ships are more expensive and um, the costs per ton are increasing. The pinch point is reached downstream at Kaub. Some large barges can no longer pass here. This isn't the bank of the River Rhine that I'm standing on. It's the bed of the River Rhine. So much has the water receded over the last couple of months because of the lack of rainfall. And the ships that you can see passing behind me would normally have about two metres of water beneath them. So that, that's about that much water. But at the minute, some parts have got as little as this much water, 40 centimetres below the boats as they pass. And the land the Rhine ribbons through is equally parched. For 30 years, Reinhold Hörner has watched his vineyard slowly desiccate. He's noticed the insects and the weeds changing. He last saw rain on June the 6th. Hier haben wir Sonnenbrand. Die Sonne ist hier zu heiß hier drauf gebrannt. Wir haben das ist Westseite und das ist das Ergebnis. Hier ist quasi die Hälfte, 50 Prozent, ist total Schaden kaputt. 50 Prozent. Wow. Yeah. The steps that they are taking to try to combat the hot weather on this vineyard are quite extraordinary. They're pumping 30,000 litres of water onto these young vines every single day. They're also allowing the leaves to grow bigger and to shelter the grapes below. They've got two planes and two pilots on standby for the whole of the summer in case there should be a hailstorm which would damage the grapes. It's not just the wine harvest at threat. His neighbours have lost a third of their corn. It's just stopped growing. Oh, no. Yeah. It's kaput. Kaput, we know that in any language. The Rhine may, for now, still be teeming with life. 
but many Germans are questioning for how much longer they will be able to rely upon it as an economic lifeline. Oh, we, we saw those fish at the end of that report, but the Rhine is still fine for fish. But there are rivers in France that we've heard of where fish are dying because as the rivers shrink, the amount of space the fish have shrinks and the oxygen shrinks with it. I mean, the Rhine is not, as you heard in my report, just a river. It's a vital artery. And, and if you look at where we are now, there's a massive fort over this confluence of the two rivers. This is a river that has been fought over for years. So key is it to, to Germany's economy. And along the stretch of the River Rhine, it is, there are vineyards, there are castles all the way along the side of, of this river. And the people that we've spoken to over the last couple of days are really acknowledging that there is a change happening to this river. It is getting smaller. The land around it is getting drier. I think they sense that change is coming and that if anything uh, can be done, that they have to change with it. And, and all the people that we have spoken to here say they firmly believe that what is happening here to this river and to the lands around it is a direct result of climate change. Yeah, really quite alarming. Jane, thanks very much indeed. Well, back here, today's drought announcement will see the Environment Agency and water companies across the affected areas implementing their plans to manage falling water levels. Those plans will more than likely uh, include more restrictions. Here in Kent, a hosepipe ban was introduced today, as Ivor Bennett reports. It is the Garden of England, but how can anything bloom in this? The village greens of Kent haven't been that colour for weeks. What we put in here is a gravel garden. Roger Field helps to maintain the flower beds in the village of Lye with his wife Joyce. But even before this hosepipe ban, they were already resigned to losing them. It wouldn't be a tragedy as such, but it would be a shame. And it would be um, another sort of nail in the coffin of a village life. I can't remember last time now when we really, what I call really, had rain. It must have been about April. I really can't remember. And for those who rely on the green fingered here, things are now even harder. As a business, this garden centre outside Tunbridge is exempt from the restrictions, but its customers aren't. And having seen sales halve over the summer, they fear they'll dry up even further. It is a quiet time, but it's really quiet right now because putting a plant into the ground today is a challenge. I mean, physically getting out in the garden, you've got to be conscious of sunburn and all those things as well. So. It, it is having a, a huge impact across garden centres and British nurseries throughout the country. Anyone who breaks the hosepipe ban could be fined up to £1,000, but it seems there are few here willing to do as South East Water asks and grass up any neighbours breaking the rules. Will you be snitching on any neighbours? if you No, I will not. I think that's dreadful. I wouldn't go out of my way to grass someone in. I've just come through a traffic jam that's got a burst pipe going running down the road and there's nobody working on it so you sort of think to yourself if it's that important mend the leaks as unprecedented as these conditions are people here know they may have to get used to them but that means not just reducing how much water we use there's also a real need for us as a society to improve how water is collected and stored for the future but when pushed by Sky News, water regulator Offwatt refused to pin blame on providers, despite three billion litres lost through leakage every day nationwide. What we're doing, seeing on demand reduction and what we're seeing on leakage reduction needs to go a lot further. We absolutely accept that. With the target for the sector is reduced leaks by 50 That suggests 50%. you recognise there has been a failure. No, I, what I recognise is there's, there's quite a long way to go. And so for now, the onus is on households to maintain water supplies. No wonder then, some are seeking out the few natural sources that remain. Ivor Bennett, Sky News in Kent. Well, this year's drought has been caused by seven months of unusually dry weather. Earlier, we sent our science correspondent Thomas Moore deep underground, but he's also been assessing the drop in rainfall across the country. What a difference a year makes. These are satellite images for July this year and 12 months ago. England's green pastures turned brown. Met Office stats show southern England had just 10 millimetres of rain in July, the driest in records back to 1836, before even Queen Victoria was on the throne. So how does the current situation compare to 1976, an exceptional drought year? 
when people got their water from standpipes. Our map shows that July's rainfall in the southeast corner of the country this year has been well below the levels of 1976. What about the year so far? After all, droughts are the result of months of dry weather. Well, let's look at Kent, where the cumulative rainfall total for 2022 is well below the long-term average. But so far, it's still higher than 1976. Now, of course, temperatures this summer have been much higher, and that's left the landscape parched. Latest data from the Environment Agency shows the soil in Devon and Cornwall is close to its driest ever for the time of year. River levels at the end of July were also exceptionally low in many parts of the country. The Thames in Windsor had the lowest flow on record. So did the Crane, Brent and Ingrebourne in London. And in East Anglia, the Waveney, Little Ouse and Ely Ouse, where water was just 5% of the long-term average. Levels in the underground aquifers that supply water to millions of people are also falling in many areas. They're exceptionally low in monitoring sites in the Cotswolds and the South Downs. And reservoir levels are falling fast as demand for water has soared. Ardingly in Sussex and the lower Thames reservoirs have never been lower than this at this time of year. Much of England is short of water and with August expected to be dry in the south, it is only going to get worse. Well, drought conditions, of course, bring with them a greater threat of fire. Uh, we've seen a grass fire in Raynham in Essex today with the chair of uh, National Fire Chiefs Council saying soaring temperatures are making incidents harder to manage and harder to put out. Meanwhile, the National Farmers Union says tinder dry crops and parched grass pose a huge danger. Uh, Chief North of England correspondent Greg Milam reports now on the growing fire risk. High up on the moors, the wildfire specialists from West Yorkshire Fire Service are on high alert. Increasingly hot, dry weather has created the perfect conditions for fires up here, and the way they deal with them has had to evolve. They now use these off-road vehicles that can reach fires regular engines can't in terrain like this. Location is massive uh, up here because you, you've no water, so we've only got a limited amount of water, so we have to have water to deal with the fire, but then we've also got to have a backup plan. And it doesn't take much to start a fire. The message to the public is just, you know, be very mindful and careful of what you're doing in this beautiful countryside. We are on top of the moor now and the wind is blustery. This grass is very, very dry. And it wasn't that long ago that a fire swept up the hillside over there and came perilously close to this transmitter, which would have wiped out communications across a huge area. It's another illustration of how these wildfires are potentially affecting people way beyond just the countryside. The fires on the moors this summer have spread to areas not usually affected. And fires like this in a cornfield, once rare, have also become more common. For the fire service, the causes and the need to change is unmistakable. We've seen the effects of climate change developing, but what we've just seen is radically different, a, a completely different end of a continuum. And if that's a peep into the future, then I think we've got to go back and we've got to look at everything we've done to date and just reassess about whether that's what we need going forward or whether we need to do even more. And I think that applies to society as well. It's been a quiet couple of days for the wildfire team, but with more people out on a hot weekend, they know that's unlikely to last. Greg Milam, Sky News, West Yorkshire. Well, I should just tell you that in the last hour, a major incident has been declared in Derbyshire, where 12 uh, fire crews are dealing with a fire in fields and uh, around a farm. Uh, 50 properties in that area have been evacuated in Creswell, with uh, local residents gathering at uh, the village's events centre, that fire in Derbyshire. So across this desperately dry land, the inevitable has now happened and much of the country is now officially under drought restrictions. As we enter another weekend of baking temperatures, millions of people in this country are now being asked to change the way they live in terms of water usage. How long it will last, no one knows. That depends on the weather, on nature and what it has in store for us. We leave you now with a look at how this summer of unrelenting heat has changed the face of Britain.